Welcome to the October session of Lifelong Learning. So great to see you all. Um, for those of you that are returning with us uh, via Zoom, welcome back. And for those of you that are joining us the first time in this modality, welcome. I'm going to introduce Dean Helen Easterling Williams, the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Psychology, to uh, share a greeting and introduce our keynote. So, Dean Williams. Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again. As Vanessa has said, it is uh, a unique format for us, but it is one that the Lifelong Learning Women's Forum has managed quite well. We are delighted that we're able to um, visit with many more of you in this setting. And now it is my esteemed pleasure to present my colleague, my friend on most days. <laughs> always my colleague and always my friend. Um, my fellow compadre from New Jersey even. So I, I present to you and uh, reintroduce to many, Dean Pete Peterson from the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. You should know that Pete is a leading national speaker and a writer. He writes on issues related to civil participation and the use of technology to make government a more responsive and transparent entity. He was the first executive director of the bipartisan organization entitled Common Sense California which in 2010 joined with the Davenport Institute at the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine to become the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement and Civic Learning, Civic Leadership. Um, Pete has co-created and currently co-facilitates the training seminar called the Public Engagement, the Vital leadership skill in difficult times program. Um, that program has served, I know over 2000 entities and it might even be approaching 3000 or more by now. Pete can tell us more about that later. Um, but he writes widely on public engagement for a variety of major news outlets he uh, has been a public affairs fellow at the Hoover Institution. And uh, he has even served on many boards, one of which is Homeland Security Advisor Council. I am uh, delighted to present the former Republican candidate for the California Secretary of State from 2014 and um, one that I hope one day will enter that political race again, uh, because the gifts and the skills and the talents and the graces that he has uh, would be a blessing to all of California and I believe all of our nation. He can go toe to toe with the very best of them and still leave everyone feeling blessed. And so without any further ado, I present a holy man, a man steeped in the word of God, a man who puts God above everything. He seeks first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. And I know because I walk with him. And so ladies, please welcome Dean Pete Peterson from Pepperdine University. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. It is, it is such an honor to be back. And thank you, Dean Williams, for that incredible mm -hmm. introduction. Uh, as we were chatting about, as uh, we were going through our, our microphone checks about 15 or 20 minutes ago, I can't believe it's been four years since I've been with you all. Um, and here we are uh, in the midst of a pandemic, uh, wishing that we were all together in person 
in Kathy's backyard. And Kathy, thanks again for your support of, of this series and, and these discussions. Um, I had so much fun being with you four years ago. And um, as I prepared for this presentation, um, I was, it's, it's certainly the date on the calendar I've seen from weeks away that I've been looking forward to. So what I wanted to do, uh, somewhat similar to my presentation with you four years ago, is uh, go over a lot of data, um, because in politics, especially these days, there is a lot of data. And, um, but unlike our time together um, before the 2016 election, I'm gonna shorten the time that I spend on this presentation uh, reduce the number of slides that I use uh, because I think it's it's a I don't I don't think these Zoom gatherings as great as they can be uh, lend themselves to 45 minutes worth of a slide deck um, and and frankly I think this is a time for conversation and civil conversation as well and. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I allotted enough time for that. So I'm gonna begin by uh, sharing my screen here. And again, I've got about uh, 20 minutes of slides. As Vanessa said when uh, she introduced uh, this uh, session, we, I invite all of your questions via the, the chat feature down at the bottom of the screen at any time, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to kind of not fly through this deck, but move through this deck um, and reserve as much time as I can on the back end to answer any questions that you might have. So why don't I begin here with um, the agenda that I have for this morning. Uh, first to look at uh, and take a step back and understand really how different this election year is from any, certainly in my memory, and I think for the most part on the, uh, in the opinion of many historians, I think it's fair to say that we are living history, um, that uh, historians will be writing books about the period that we are now currently living in, or some would say uh, enduring, um, for years, decades, centuries to come. And it's not always that you can say that. Um, so I get asked a lot of questions about where we are in our politics and how it fits into a historical arc. And I think sometimes when things are feeling so out of control, which is a phrase that I hear a lot um, from friends and, and colleagues of mine, that we should give ourselves the grace to step back and realize uh, this is a unique time in American history. And it's worth taking stock of the fact that if we don't know exactly what's happening or what's coming, um, that's okay. Because um, all the experts have been wrong. And as I'll go through here in a second, uh, as close as we are to the election, um, anyone who can say with absolute surety what is going to happen on November 3rd and the days following um, is only basing that opinion on a little bit of information. And so this is not a time for experts as I say, as I'm about to, go, I'm about to go through a bunch of slides here that make me sound like an expert, but I'm really not, really not. And I don't think anybody can be, um, which while unsettling, I think again, should give us some grace uh, and give each other grace about what we say we know or don't know about American politics today. So then I wanna go through uh, very quickly, the state of the races, not only the presidential race, but as you know, we also have uh, congressional races happening around the country, uh, particularly here in California with some very pivotal races and the Senate races as well. Uh, take a look at what could happen. 
And then I want to close with, uh, in, in some ways, uh, similar ways that I did four years ago, to look beyond the politics. Um, I'm convinced this year more than almost any other year uh, that that phrase uh, that has been thrown about in public discourse, that politics is downstream of culture, is, is more true this year than any year that I can remember. Um, that our politics are responding to a cultural moment uh, that is defined, frankly, by loneliness and alienation. And while that may not seem to be a very uh, quantitative thing or a hardened political science theory, um, I think our issues that we're dealing with in our political discussions are really downstream of a set of cultural and societal factors, <clears throat> even psychological factors um, that are worth taking stock of. This past Friday, I, uh, we co-sponsored here at the Policy School a conversation with the Capitol Hill-based Bible study group called Faith and Law. And I co-hosted the conversation with uh, Dr. Francie Broghammer, who is um, a chief psychiatry resident at the University of California, Irvine. And the conversation was really about the increasing sense of loneliness um, that Americans are experiencing and how in some ways this loneliness, this detachment from each other is actually contributing to a hyper-politicization of our identities and thereby our public discourse in ways that I think are frankly poisonous uh, to America's political culture. So I'm gonna end with a couple of those pieces. So I'm gonna begin with, uh, as I said before, whether, whether it's actually too soon to have this conversation. Uh, even though we are less than a month away from this election, uh, there remain a lot of variables here. And um, of course, it would be ridiculous to do this the day before the election. But I think, again, this conversation that we hear so often or watch on, on television from political pundits and experts of various kinds, um, there's, there remains some massive questions uh, that will have some impact on the election results in November 3rd, um, but uh, we don't yet know the disposition of these events. So let's just look at the obvious, the president's health. The president has said today that he is not going to agree to a remote debate, um, which had been originally scheduled for Miami of next week. Does that mean that he is not going to debate? Does that, is that some sort of indicator of his health? Um, certainly could have an impact. We all know that with this COVID that even initial positive diagnoses can swing within one or two days. Um, that someone who seems to be on the upswing uh, can uh, very quickly experience a downturn in their conditions would radically change the condition of this race. The hearings for uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett begin next week. Uh, how will they be perceived and how will they be conducted? Uh, it's fair to say that the hearings for uh, Judge now Justice Kavanaugh in many ways helped uh, the Republicans in the Senate races for 2018. Um, how will these re uh, hearings be conducted, uh, which will be obviously incredibly public? What are going to be the broader overall trends for COVID-19? Uh, do we see on the horizon a vaccine? Uh, do we see this second wave that will send various regions even into uh, much worse conditions? Do we see trends in other countries improving much more quickly than the United States, which would make our response uh, look weak by comparison? Um, Federal Prosecutor Durham's report into uh, 
the uh, FBI's research into the uh, possible relationship between the President Trump's 2016 campaign and Russia. Uh, we are expecting to see that fairly soon. Uh, could there be a misstep by Vice President Biden? Um, he has been someone who has been given to making gaffes here and there. Uh, I think it's fair to say that most of that is understood just to be one of his um, ways of presenting that this can happen. Um, but could something be said in the waning days of the campaign uh, that could swing what, what may be a very close race one way or the other? Or obviously, is there some sort of other October or dare I say early November surprise? Now, I wanted to run through uh, some of the polling here. And, and this is about as up to date as I could get. I very much like the website Real, Real Clear Politics in that it presents really a very, not only a balanced view uh, with writers and opinion makers from both the left and the right, but in their polling area, they draw from a number of top polls um, regionally, uh, but also nationally and create what they call the RCP average, which is what you see here. So this is the current state of the race between President Trump and Vice President Biden. And as you look down at that spread column on the right, it would be hard not to be very heartened if you're a Biden supporter. Uh, every single national poll shows Vice President Biden with a lead ranging from five to 13 points. Uh, and all of these polling uh, or survey sources that they use are highly credible and widely uh, respected. And so this average that you see there at the top of a lead of 7.8 points uh, by Vice President Biden certainly has to make that campaign um, again, very encouraged about the current state of play. But of course, it's not just the national polling that's important. We do have an electoral college. And with that electoral college, uh, we need to look at the so-called battleground states, those states that, uh, depending on how they swing, uh, would certainly have the broader impact on what is called the race to 270, which is the 270 electoral votes that uh, we know really determine who our next president will be. And as you see there, again, across the uh, different battleground states from Florida down to Arizona, you see uh, Vice President Biden with uh, certainly a closer lead but still a lead across all of those states, ranging from half a percentage point in North Carolina to 5.5%, or I'm sorry, 6.4% in Pennsylvania. And down below, you look at a kind of a tracking average uh, going back to the beginning of this year that showed that there was a moment there in the spring and summer uh, where these polls tightened up quite a bit but then expanded again as we went into July, uh, tightened up a bit when we got into the uh, conventions and are now uh, broadening again. But I wanted to show you this one as well. And I think this is a, a very interesting um, chart that compares the top battleground states between this year and 2016. And again, these were the polling averages, uh, not the election results, but the polling averages between this year and 2016, the race between President Trump and then uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton. And what you see there is something of, of at least, uh, if you happen to be a, a Trump supporter, uh, a, a slight glimmer of hope, which is to say, you see that comparing 2020 to 2016, you see that across these battleground states, uh, 
Uh, President Trump held a significant lead going back from the spring to June. June is when we saw the, the, the spike again in COVID cases. That led to him falling behind his averages uh, four years ago with Vice President Biden taking the lead in these polling averages. As we get towards August, then we get into the uh, conventions, and you see the conventions actually help provide a spike, also with some positive economic news there in late August and into early September. Uh, President Trump then gets a, a slight uptick relative to where he was four years ago. And then you see the uh, increase again in cases that we've seen, um, some bad economic news in uh, September, the closing of schools. Um, and you see then again, a dropping behind where he was four years ago, Vice President Biden assuming a lead. And then you see that little red blip there, uh, right there that's been surveyed in the last week or so in which President Trump is actually three-tenths of a point ahead of where he was in the battleground polls uh, this year compared to last year. So here's the state of the race. Again, it's an electoral college. Um, and you see the, the red states there are the, the likely states for Trump. Uh, the deep blue states are the likely states or solid states for um, Vice President Biden. You see the toss-ups there in gray. And obviously, those are places that are going to determine who our next president is, whether it's Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, which indeed is a toss-up state this year, uh, Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Uh, these are all the states that we, if you're uh, looking to see where are the indicators, um, those are the states where uh, we're going to see indications. Uh, certainly as you look at the East Coast where we'll be seeing um, election results in before the others, uh, certainly will give us a hint of where election night, or at least maybe the days ahead, may be going. And so you see there at the top, in the race to 270, uh, Vice President Biden has what is believed to be a fairly solid bank of 226 electoral votes. Obviously, having California and New York in that bank um, are significant, as well as Massachusetts and Maryland. Uh, but on the Trump side, you only see 125, which are believed to be solid uh, Trump states and in the middle, 187 electoral votes, which are deemed to be toss up. And those are all the states as we just covered that are in the dark gray. As we look to the Senate, this is another uh, very crucial set of races. As you know, uh, the Republicans currently hold a very slim lead of three seats in the US Senate. And as we head into election day, there are, as you see there at the top, eight toss-up states with an exact split of uh, a forecasted 46 Senate seats um, being held or won by the Democrats and 46 Senate seats held or won by Republicans. Uh, a couple ones that you see there in the toss-up category, again, in the dark gray, if you're seeing that, uh, color correctly, uh, the McSally race, and you see many of those toss-up states are Republican races. And so the flipping of those states to Democrat uh, certainly would swing the balance of power in the Senate. So you see McSally, uh, Purdue, uh, Joni Ernst in Iowa, uh, Susan Collins in Maine, uh, Danes uh, in Montana, uh, Tom Tillis in North Carolina, and even Lindsey Graham in South Carolina. All of those are deemed to be toss-up races, which again will determine the balance of power in the Senate. As we go to the House races, again, um, the, the Democrats currently hold sway there with 
House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Uh, it is believed that they are estimated that they are banking about 214 seats. Uh, 218 are needed to hold the majority or assume the majority. 214 for the Democrats, 190 for the Republicans, and you see there 31 toss-up races, which again are indicated in the gray. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but because there are three toss-up races right here in California, I thought I'd uh, pull those out. You see there in the middle category, CA21 is the Central Valley District currently held by a Democrat, David Valadeo, uh, held that seat prior to 2018. Um, that is going to be a very tough race as he tries to win that seat back. That would flip that seat. And also CA25 there you see at the top is the East LA County seat, which is Palmdale and Lancaster. Uh, that is, was held in a special, uh, or won and flipped by a Republican in a special election named Mike Garcia. Uh, he is now running for the full term election in that seat and that will also be an extremely tight race. And you also see across the top CA39 which you see there in the blue is currently held by a Democrat, uh, Harley Ruda. Uh, that is a race that uh, Michelle Steele, an Orange County supervisor, is looking to uh, swing back into the Republican column. Again, that would be a flip if that happened, but again, a very uh, tight race there. Now, it's fair to say, again, that given all the polling uh, that I've just gone through, uh, Trump, uh, President Trump is in a hole. Uh, he has to be considered as the underdog at this point. Uh, Vice President Biden has a lead again, not only in the national polls of a scale that has rarely, if ever, been um, uh, overtaken, and again, in the, in the battles, battleground polls, uh, th those all are breaking uh, Vice President Biden's way. But there are some indicators for those of you who may uh, support the president that some of this polling um, may not tell the entire story. This is a, a recent survey by the firm uh, Cloud Research, which looked into uh, asking questions of Republicans and Democrat voters about uh, whether they're actually answering uh, polling or survey questions. And I found these results to be pretty interesting. As you see, 11.7% of Republicans say they would not report their true opinions about their preferred presidential candidate on telephone polls. In contrast, 5.4% of Democrats say they'd be reluctant to share their true voting intentions. 10.5% of independents fell into what's called this shy voter category, just a percentage below, uh, lower than how Republicans reacted to polls. And then below, after asking about people uh, expressing their true opinions on telephone calls, we then inquired about their preferred candidate. 10.1% of Trump voters said they were likely to be untruthful on phone surveys, double the number of Biden supporters at 5.1%. A couple more bullet points, and this I wanted to pull from Thomas Edsel, who uh, certainly is a man of the left, a columnist for the New York Times, uh, wrote this piece a couple weeks ago uh, in which uh, he hinted at some things that may point to a tighter race than is currently indicated by the polls. A couple uh, bullet points from his piece. Um, one is the amount of registrations that are happening. Uh, in the battleground states of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, Democratic registrations are actually down 150,000 um, relative to the work that they had done back in 2016, which is to say that Republicans are actually registering a higher number of new voters than Democrats are, which again is interesting in the sense that Democrats are known as a party to usually have much better what we call ground games. 
um, than Republicans. Um, but this year, and in part, it's, it's due to uh, their commitment to it. And also, frankly, as we remember, Vice President Biden uh, certainly didn't look like he was going to be the Democrat, Democratic Party's nominee um, really halfway into the primary season. And so some of these battleground operations, which the Republicans have had a couple of years to put into place, uh, the Democrats have just not had that opportunity. And so one indication is that Republicans, the national GOP reports 14 million door knocks or in-person voter engagements in the battleground states. Uh, the Democrats have had almost zero. Um, and again, so the, the, the ground game piece of this may uh, play a role in this election. A very interesting data point, um, which especially to my uh, friends on the left, um, I, I think it would be difficult to fully appreciate, um, is that Trump stands to draw the highest percentage of Hispanic and black voters than any GOP candidate in my lifetime. Um, I understand how the president is perceived, but on another note or through another window, it's fair to say that he's done more to court and attract voters of color um, than certainly any Republican president in my lifetime. At the same time, where Trump is really getting hammered are by, uh, in the polling, is, are by white women uh, usually living in the suburbs. Uh, this was a group of people that really did uh, support the president, or at least a majority did, in 2016. And there has been a radical change in that demographic with voters leaving the president and uh, swinging their support towards the vice president. The defund the police movement um, is something that has become a part of at least some uh, of the uh, supporters or officials within the Democratic Party. It could be argued that that has not been playing well more broadly among voters. And then there's the issue of absentee ballots, um, which as someone who ran for Secretary of State, uh, and this is not an issue of, of either voter fraud or voter suppression, uh, absentee ballots are just not counted at the same rate that in-person ballots are. Uh, there is a rejection rate, and again, this is in Democrat as well as Republican states, uh, that may only be one or two percent of absentee ballots being rejected because of incorrect filling out of the ballot or an incorrect signature or a signature that is perceived not to match uh, the voter roll. But suffice it to say, in some of these battleground states, if it comes down to a half or 1%, um, this, these, that could be an issue that uh, determines who wins a particular state. I wanted to go quickly, but importantly, through these more sociological factors. Um, and this, this shows um, a nation divided in, in ways that I don't, I don't remember, again, in my lifetime. Uh, this is from the Pew Research Center, uh, just from about uh, two months ago, in which uh, people talk, were asked a question of a percentage of registered voters who say a certain percentage of their close friends support uh, either uh, Trump or Biden. And as you see in the headline, majorities of Trump-Biden voters say they have, quote, just a few or no friends who support the other candidate. And you see there, uh, both in uh, Trump voters, uh, but also Biden voters, um, a dearth of friends uh, who support the other candidate. And I think this is actually a, a, a big deal um, as we think about civil discourse, um, because I think in some ways we treat our friends differently than we, we treat those maybe on social media or, or people that are holding forth on television. And uh, it's very possible that uh, we learn more about why 
someone would support a candidate from a different political party, uh, we learn that, I think, most clearly from our friends. And if it is the case, as indicated here, that we have fewer and fewer friends who may not agree with us politically, um, that's a voice into our lives that uh, I think is really missing um, and will contribute to greater levels of polarization. The next level on this same set of polls is older voters are more likely to say a lot of their close friends share their, uh, their candidate uh, preference. And so you see there among Trump supporters and among Biden voters, uh, when you look at the 65 and up category in age, uh, in, in Trump, 65% uh, have a lot of friends who support Trump, 36% have no friends who support Biden. Uh, on the Biden side, 58% of friends support Biden, um, but 35% of Biden supporters say they have no friends who support Trump. Now, there are a couple other things here I wanted to touch on, which are the preferences on the role of government. Because I actually think when you look at changes in trend lines, uh, it's important to think about how this might roll out or impact things politically. You see there, the lighter green line is the percentage uh, who believe that government is doing too much. And so this is a broader set of questions around Americans' preference for the role of government. The darker green line is the percentage who think that government should do more. And you see there, for the better part of the last 20 years, um, certainly you see that flip happening almost exactly on 9-11. But really, for the last um, almost 30 years, Americans have believed, and this is a cross party, Americans have believed that government uh, does too much and that they would prefer the government do less. And so that changed on 9-11, I think for understandable reasons. Uh, and then it changed again uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And you see here the largest gap that we've seen in the last 30 years. Now, does this just mean the federal government? Uh, maybe. Um, I think it could also mean uh, state governments or local governments. But I don't think we should quickly dismiss this because it's so different than what we've seen over 30 years of polling, um, that Americans want government to do more. And it's obvious that they want them to do more because of the timing here, in response to the pandemic. And I think it's fair to say that if you're the party in power when this happens, uh, it chances are you're not going to be benefited by a poll like this. Um, but again, it'll be interesting to see how this, how this plays out. Then I wanna look at the, the partisan nature of the poll I just showed you. And while the, the trend lines have been fairly consistent among the parties, uh, you see there, and again, this is just on the category of percentage who say government should do more to solve our, our, party's pro our country's problems. Look at that center line, which are the independents, which in the 2016 election, only 35% of independents thought government should do more. And now, or at least most recently, that number is up to 56%. That's almost a 50% uh, increase um, uh, in that number. And I think, again, that would be something that would, that would bode well uh, for the party out of power, uh, whether that's in the White House or even in the State House. This issue around Americans' perceptions of political parties, views, and policies. Uh, again, you see another change from 2000 to 2004 to 2020. Uh, the number of those believing that the Republican Party is too extreme rose from 35 to 47 percent. Generally, mainstream has dipped from 57 to 52 percent. Views on the Democratic Party actually have increased 
Uh, those seeing it as too extreme went from 26 up to 42 percent, uh, but generally mainstream has dropped 67 to 57 percent. So what you see here is that people are viewing both parties as becoming too extreme, while certainly Democrats are seen as more mainstream. Um, both parties now are seen increasingly as being too extreme. And so I wanted to close with this slide. This is from a piece that my friend Ryan Streeter at the American Enterprise Institute wrote about this intersection of loneliness and political polarization. Uh, he used uh, the general population survey um, and delved into some of these national numbers uh, for a piece that we commissioned for the website Real Clear Politics. And I quoted this one piece, and here are some bullet points. By contrast, active members of political organizations have an average loneliness score two points higher than the national average. It's the only volunteering activity to register above the national average. So you see here again, this was a review of uh, perceptions of loneliness by people who were volunteering versus none. And there was only one category of volunteering that actually showed an increased level of loneliness. All the other forms of volunteering at church, um, in the Qantas Club, in organizations like this, um, all show decreased levels of loneliness. But this political volunteering, if that was the only form of volunteering, actually showed a heightened sense of loneliness. Young adults, 18 to 35, are seven times more likely to volunteer in politics than their socially active peers who are not lonely. 87% of what they call these, these political volunteers say politics gives them a source of identity versus 63% of Americans. 62% of these political volunteers only find community online versus less than half of all Americans. And interestingly, while it's fairly balanced, uh, the trend line of these heightened political volunteers tends to be slightly more on the left and actually with a higher education attainment level than average Americans. And so with that, I wanted to bring it back to, to you all and, and thank you again for uh, this opportunity to, to talk about what is going to be uh, and is a historic um, campaign and political season. And, uh, and one that uh, I think for a variety of reasons needs to concern us um, for these political cultural issues that I'm afraid are not going to be determined by whoever wins the election on November 3rd. Thank you, Dean Peterson, for all of that data and research and, and directing us um, in ways that we may have not thought of before. I'm going to open it up to questions either in the chat or you can use the uh, raise your hand feature to be called on. Um, but I'll get it started with a question that was submitted by Robin um, in relation to how you started about politics being a downstream of culture. Uh, Robin was wondering if you could comment on what you see as the role of social media in maybe dumbing down or giving us false information and the impact on our views of democracy and policy making. Yeah, I'm a, I wish I had a more positive view of social media, but I think both the surveys show and also I think all of our personal experiences show that the format of social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, even Instagram, um, does not lend itself to um, a deliberative uh, conversation or process. And at the same time, and I've experienced this personally, maybe some of you have as well, um, lends itself to really a rather snarky form of um, engagement um, that is very easy to hit that, you know, that one kind of um, quick message or quick article to, in attempt to um, respond to somebody. And um, uh, so I'm afraid that social media has actually exacerbated uh, these problems. And I think sometimes it's easy to lose track of the fact 
that a majority of Americans are still not on, uh, say, Twitter. A vast majority of Americans are not on Twitter. And so as someone who is probably too much, as I am, um, it's very easy to get into these bubble-like cultures where you think all of Americans are doing this. And you see, wow, something's been retweeted or liked 10,000 times. There are 180 million voters in America. You have more people than that who live in Malibu. Um, so it's, it's a very easy way to lose context. And so I, I do think that social media is contributing uh, to these polarization issues. Thank you. And Yaz, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Peterson. Um, would you mind sharing your comments on the current electoral college process and and maybe why it's being challenged? Um, and do you anticipate anything coming from those challenges? Well, I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the challenges to the electoral colleges, to the electoral college system are by and large coming from the left. Um, I think the experiences of two elections in the last 20 years, obviously in 2000 and 2016, where the popular vote went toward one candidate um, and the electoral college went to another um, is, is something that uh, is perceived as being undemocratic. Um, of course, the founders, the reason we have an electoral college is in part because uh, we had a country that wouldn't have come together really without it. Um, both the Electoral College and I've, I've also heard uh, challenges around uh, the fact that we have uh, two senators per state and that a state even the size of California has the same number of senators as a state that has, you know, 14 people in it like Idaho or South Dakota or something like that. Um, but those were decisions made at the founding as a way of um, understanding that we are not America. We are the United States of America. And in that, we are a republic and not a democracy, which might strike people as a bit odd. Um, but we are not a democracy. Uh, we are a republic. And as a republic, or really better as a democratic republic, uh, we have systems by which um, popular votes are represented um, and represented, say, in, in the House of Representatives. Um, but also there are these other ways of balancing the power of states. And uh, obviously the Electoral College is one of those things. Now, that's not to say that there aren't ways in which we could better balance uh, the power of the Electoral College. Um, one of the suggestions that's been made is actually implemented in two states, one being Maine and one being Nebraska, in which all of the electoral votes do not in fact go, it's not a winner take all situation. Um, so in Maine and Nebraska, the Electoral College votes for those states are actually divided by the congressional districts in that state and who wins those congressional districts. And so I'm, I'm mildly supportive of something like that. Uh, tests have been done to show, well, who would win if that system were extrapolated across the country? And um, it wouldn't change the results dramatically of any of our recent elections. Um, but I think it's something worth exploring that the winner take all element of uh, the Electoral College, as opposed to, say, a national popular vote, which would sweep away um, the Electoral College, uh, is, is a reform worth exploring. Thank you. Um, questions from our chat. Dean Peterson, do you think the election could be contested and ended up being decided by the Supreme Court? And in thinking about the Supreme Court, there's also a question about your thoughts on adding Supreme Court justices and how that might change our future? So I think it's, I think it's unlikely that um, 
this election will be decided in the Supreme Court. Um, I say that for a couple of reasons. One is it's entirely possible, given the current state of the polls, that Vice President Biden will, will win a significant, uh, win, win by a significant percentage, um, which would obviate that. Um, but at the same time, what separates this from our Florida experience in 2000 is that if there are going to be a number of uh, states with questionable uh, results, it's going to be far more than just one state. Um, I, if, if it is close, I, I think it's highly possible that we could see four or five states go through this process of either recounting or reevaluating votes. And my guess is that given how 2000 happened, um, it's probably more likely that these issues are going to be settled at the state level. Um, and it's probably going to be more than one state if it goes in that direction. To the question of uh, adding additional Supreme Court justices, again, I. I um, I think this is only happening for political reasons. Um, this is something that even as of last night's debate, uh, Senator Harris seemed noncommittal on what the parties or uh, her administration's view would be on adding Supreme Court justices. Um, I believe that's not to say that reform is not necessary. I recently co-wrote an op-ed with Stephen Heinz, who's the president of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and a Democrat, and I'm a Republican, uh, in which we argued for 18-year court terms uh, for Supreme Court justices. Um, I think that is a much better way at getting at what could be construed to be, I think, a bipartisan issue it certainly is for, for Stephen and myself, uh, that you have these lifetime appointments, um, which I think we are learning and have seen, um, do not contribute, uh, I think, to the performance of the Supreme Court as an institution. An 18-year court term would essentially give each four-year term of a presidency, two nominations to make. And so every year we would know, every election year, we would know exactly how many uh, Supreme Court justices the president would have to determine. And uh, again, it would keep uh, a turnover of those candidates in an institution which was never meant to be politicized. It is the the shortest part of our constitution, in large part because our founders thought that the judicial branch was really meant to be the least used and least important. And here we are, it becoming really a pivotal part of a presidential campaign. Thank you. Well, we want to respect your time and those of our guests who have joined us. So it is after 1030, so we want to thank you um, for sharing and imparting. And even as you said, that's not a time for experts. We appreciate your expertise. Um, thank you uh, to all of you who have joined us today. Thank you to Kathy Don Hockel um, and Dean Williams. And I do want to remind you all that we are going to um, reconvene next month, November the 12th, where we will host a psychologist, Dr. Carrie Castaneda Sound, and she's going to discuss best practices in dealing with conflicts and dialogue with others from experiences, cultures, and ethical standpoints. So I think after this presidential election, uh, some things that we learned from Dr. Sound uh, may come in handy. So you will all be receiving an invitation via email to join us there. So once again, please join me in thanking Dean Peterson for being with us. Uh, please stay safe, bless you all, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thanks all.